Good to see you today. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 to 19 as we continue our series in 1 Peter. It's a series called Trust and Obey, and we've been learning all about what it means from really the pen of uh, Peter, one of the apostles of Jesus, to the disciples in Asia Minor. We've been learning, kind of gleaning from this letter all about what it means to trust and obey God during times of difficulty. And today we come to this section that really is just about suffering as a Christian. And I know that's exactly what everybody wants to hear about today, suffering. But this is where we find ourselves in, in the letter today, and actually it's, it's poignant, it's, it's important what we have uh, to, to hear today. The question that comes to my mind is, why must we? <laughs> why must we? Who loves to suffer? Does anybody love to suffer? I do not. Most people do not love to suffer, yet suffering is actually uh, paramount with the walk of a Christ follower. It's definitely going to be there according to the scripture. And, and, and then the question becomes, well, what if we aren't? You know, as an American follower of Jesus, I have sat many times. I, I, I remember uh, being in Cairo, Egypt at one particular point, having dinner with a pastor and finding out he just got out of jail for, for uh, evangelizing. And I remember thinking to myself, like, what do I do with this 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 that says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted? Because as an American, I felt like, you know, I haven't, I haven't really been persecuted like that. And we have tension as Christ followers, specifically when it comes to being Christ followers in the United States of America, with this issue of suffering. What do we do with that? And, and the reality is for, for many of us, we don't do anything with that because we aren't facing Christian persecution. But some of you have. Some of you will. In fact, more of you will. And that's what makes this very, very important. I'm going to tell you a story you're going to need later, all right? So can you take this story, file it away, and then come back to it later? You're going to need it later. It's the story of a man and a rock. Rabbi tells the story of this man who, in a dream, heard God tell him, I want you to go to this boulder at the bottom of a mountain, this huge boulder that, that would be impossible to push up the mountain, and I want you to push it up the mountain, and so the man of faith believed God. He went to the rock. He pushed on the rock. Day one, he pushed, and he pushed from sun up until sunset. Set, and guess what happened to the rock? Nothing. Didn't go anywhere, but the man went home and slept well. The next night, same dream, gets up, push the rock. He does this for 30 days, for 60 days, for 90 days. The rock goes nowhere. He begins to get frustrated. You know, God, what, what, are you, what are you asking me to push this rock for? And the Lord says to him in a dream, look, it wasn't about moving the rock up the hill. Look at your arms. Aren't they, aren't they stronger to do my work with? Look at your legs. Aren't they uh, stronger to do my work with, think of your obedience and what you've learned. Haven't you learned to obey when it seems impossible? This is the story of the man and the rock. You're gonna need that as we move forward. So I'm gonna ask you to stand with me. We're gonna read uh, First Timothy, sorry, First Peter chapter four, verses 12 to 19 this morning. If you're our guest, we say this phrase, the very words at the end of the main text reading just to distinguish God's word from my own. Here's what the scripture says. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. 
And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. You could be seated. Now, I'll just remind you that we're talking about a letter written to Christians in Asia Minor. They're probably sitting in a house in one of these towns that are mentioned in the very first part of the letter. They're probably receiving it from the mouth of Sylvanius, the one who's bringing the letter and reading it to each one of these towns. And they're hearing in the midst of persecution and suffering and difficulty, they're hearing what they should do, how they should live, how they should be. And uh, you have to know, historically, you should know, this is not the kind of persecution that we're talking about uh, with Nero, not yet. It's not the burning of Christians on crosses up and down the Cardo and Roman towns. It's not that yet. This is the kind of persecution where Peter, even in the, in the letter today, calls insulting. It's the kind of thing that insults you for, or reviles you for being a, a Christian, a follower of Christ. What we were talking about today is Christian suffering. And there are four lessons to learn and apply uh, about suffering as Christians, and then I want to give you one way to live as a Christian in the midst of suffering. So Peter gives us these four lessons in this section I think are important. Number one is this, don't be surprised by Christian suffering. This is what I find with Americans, that we are surprised that we would face suffering. And it's not because we're Christians, it's because we're American that we think we should not face suffering as Christians. But there is no geography, no domain, no people group in the context of Scripture that is exempt from facing suffering as Christians. And the Scripture clearly tells us, don't be surprised. Now, he says in verse 12, beloved, this is what he says to the people, beloved. He's saying all of this to people, other Christians, other followers of Christ, whom he loves. This is not only motivated uh, by truth, but is motivated by love. Uh, He says, don't be surprised when the fiery trial comes. Now, he's not sugarcoating much at this point. He's saying that this is not just going to be a trial. This is not just going to be a difficulty, but this will be a, a fiery trial. Difficult. Now, it's localized at the time of the reading of this letter, I believe, but it will expand across Asia Minor to intense persecution. He says, don't be surprised when you're tested. This, is, this is, uh, uh, tells us that when this fiery trial comes to test us, that God is using it, that it's not just the enemy pushing into your life, but God is using this kind of suffering to test us, to purify us. This is his purpose for suffering, to refine and bring us closer to him. That The thing that Christian suffering will do for you and for me as an individual is that it will either draw us nearer to God and our faith or expose our lack of faith and push us farther away. This is what suffering does, and this is the purpose of God with suffering. So don't be surprised. This is, in, in, in Peter's words, not something that is strange. We should expect this. Now, this warning helps you and me recognize that it's coming and respond appropriately. It helps us know how to think So I think sometimes, uh, specifically as Americans, I think as American Christians, sometimes we mistakenly think God doesn't love us when we suffer. We think somehow because we're suffering, we've done something wrong, or God doesn't love us like we thought he loved us. And that is actually not the case. It's a wrong way of thinking. Peter's preparing them, telling them, don't be surprised. This is not strange. Know how to think When it happens to you, be prepared to think the proper way. One way of thinking, God doesn't love me. The other side of this 
the spectrum is the very next verse. Rejoice and be glad when you face this kind of suffering. And so he's teaching the people and consequently us as Christians to know how to think. Now, here's the second lesson. Rejoice when you share in Christ's sufferings. Look at verses 13 and 14. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now here, Peter is mimicking his rabbi. You know who Peter's rabbi is, right? It's Jesus. Uh, He is a Talmud, a disciple of Jesus. He followed him around. He heard him. He watched him. He saw him. And he's using his words here from the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, Jesus said to them, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Peter's telling now the church, look, Jesus told me, it's happening to me. I'm telling you, church, rejoice and be glad when you face persecution, when you face suffering in the name of Jesus. These are his words. He says this, that we need to be ready to rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. This is a a metaphor for the second coming of Christ. Now, In our moment in history, many Christians are spending much time pointing to the second coming of Christ. Peter is teaching them how to live because of the first coming of Christ. He's teaching them to live in the day with Christian suffering and rejoice and be glad so when the second coming happens, they will give glory to God. But he's teaching them to live because of the first coming of Christ. And this is how we need to live too. Now, he uses this word, insulted. He says, verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Again, this is the language of Jesus. It's uh, from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you or insult you and persecute you and utter all kinds of uh, evil against you falsely on my account. So Peter, who, who definitely would be persecuted, is telling the church, look, uh, he's not even to, to, to if you get crucified. He's talking about being insulted or reviled for the name of Christ. If you're insulted, rejoice and be glad. And and his why behind that is because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now, Now Peter's quoting Isaiah. You thought he was just a dumb fisherman, didn't you? He knows Isaiah by heart. He remembers uh, the entire Sermon on the Mount. He's saying it in this letter. He is not a dumb fisherman. He is transformed. He's a denier of fishermen, changed by Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit. And now he's, he's reiterating all the words of God. And he says in Isaiah chapter, it says in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So what Peter is saying to the church, when you face persecution, when you're insulted for the name of Jesus, just like the spirit of the Lord rests on Jesus, you, uh, you have the spirit of the Lord resting upon you. This is his point. And so don't be surprised by Christian suffering, but secondly, rejoice when you share in Christ's suffering. Now, Christ's ultimate suffering, he suffered a lot, but his ultimate suffering was death to the point of death on the cross. Later, he would tell his disciples, if any, or earlier, he would tell his disciples, if anyone would follow me, he's gonna have to take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. I mean, this suffering, this Christian suffering thing is paramount in the Christian faith. Now, here's the third lesson. Don't confuse suffering because of sin and Christian suffering, because there's a difference. Don't confuse suffering because of sin and Christian suffering, because there is a difference. In the scripture, suffering because of your own sin. You, you, 
You know you're not supposed to sin. You sin. You do it anyway, and suffering comes. Consequences come. That is viewed as shameful. Jesus can take that, that shame away when you repent, but it is shameful. That's not the kind of suffering we're talking about. And, and Peter lists everything from murder to meddling. So uh, if you think to yourself, you know, I'm not a murderer, so I'm good there. Have you ever meddled in anybody's business? Uh, that the word could literally be translated busybody. So from murder to meddling, right? If you suffer for that, that's, that's shameful. But if you suffer as a Christian, it's not shameful, but it's glorifying to God. Sometimes we attribute other kinds of suffering to Christian suffering just because we're a Christian. For instance, this pandemic, is it causing suffering all across the world? to Christian and non-Christian alike. Yes, it's not just Christian suffering, it's suffering. It's very general and global. It's, it's not unique to you being insulted for Jesus. But the college student who stands up in a science class related to his or her view of the creation of the world and is insulted by the professor, is that Christian persecution. Could be. It could be. So here's the, here's the reality. Separate suffering. There's general suffering. There's suffering because of our sin, but then there is Christian suffering. This is why I say at the beginning, like many of us, a large percentage of us in America don't do anything with this because we have not been insulted or persecuted for the name of Jesus. There's Different. That, that it's different to suffer from your sin or to generally suffer than it is to suffer because of your allegiance to Jesus. Ask yourself, have I ever suffered? Have I ever been persecuted because of the name of Jesus? Now, here's the fourth thing that we learn from Peter here, that judgment begins with the household of God. If you go to verse 17, here's what you'll see. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So here we're moving from what does suffering or persecution in the life of the individual Christian do to them? It purifies them. They can learn to rejoice and be glad, to think properly, to draw nearer to the Lord. Now we move to what does it do? What does Christian suffering do? What does God use it for in the church? When the church goes through the fiery suffering or persecution, and here's what we know from the scripture. When the church goes through this, now many things happen. One is that Jesus purifies his church by exposing false believers. He purifies his church by exposing false believers. And the reality is, in America, in the South, where it's, it, it has been in the past a thing for everybody to go to church. Here's what I remember very clearly about week one at Baylor University. I went to Bedside Baptist the first week. Have you, anybody ever been there? Just the kind where you don't get out of your bed and you say you're at Bedside Baptist Church. It's a joke. You can laugh even <laughs> through your mask or through the internet. It's funny. Uh, but that's where I went, and I went to uh, lunch at one of the, uh, the cafeterias there, and I noticed that other people that were also at Bedside Baptist that morning got up after they attended Bedside Baptist about 10.30, and they got dressed, and they acted like they went to church to go to lunch. And I was like, hmm, that, that's interesting. And that's, that's wholly American, to say that we practice some kind of religion but not walk as followers of Jesus. It, it, it stinks for Christianity in America. And so one of the things that's happening that happens when the church goes through Christian suffering is he purifies his church by exposing false believers, those of us that are not walking with Jesus, that just kind of, just kind of want to be around it but don't want to walk with him. Because he calls us to be disciples, not attenders. There's a difference. And so he purifies his church. He exposes false believers. The second thing he does 
He reveals his people as he brings them through suffering and exposes those that are not his people as they fail to trust in Christ in the sufferings. What we know is that when things get difficult, either people draw nearer to God based on their faith or they fall away from God based on their lack of faith. And this is what happens in the context of the church. When Christian persecution comes, when suffering comes, he is revealing his people and he brings them through the suffering. He's a good shepherd, but he also exposes those who are not his people. Matthew says it's a separation of the sheep and the goats. If you go to Israel ever, you'll see the goats and the sheep are all mixed up. They're all together in the flocks. Well, Jesus used this analogy and says it's going to separate the sheep's the sheep and the goats. And this is what happens in the church when it goes through persecution. And then number three, we have to get from this passage of scripture that if if judgment, uh, suffering, persecution begins in the church, that judgment begins in the church, if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And then he quotes Proverbs now. So now Peter's quoted Proverbs, Isaiah, and the Sermon on the Mount from Jesus that he heard with his own own ears, right? He's given us all of this wisdom, all of this prophecy, all of this teaching, how it comes together through, through, through Jesus. And we have to think about this. What happens to those who don't obey the gospel of God? I mean, he's making a point to the church sitting in that little house in Asia Minor of urgency. Now, I think it's interesting that he uses the word obey the gospel of God instead of believe the gospel of God. Isn't that interesting? Because we always say, if you just believe. He says, obey. He says, obey the gospel of God. So what happens in persecution when they don't obey the gospel of God? You know, all through scripture, the first step is belief. But belief comes from hearing and obeying. It's evidenced by hearing and obeying. It's the difference in someone saying, I believe, but their life and their words do not indicate that there's any discipleship, any fellowship of Jesus, any fruit. It's the difference between that and someone who hears and obeys. And so, So we need to understand as Christians, as the church, we suffer first. We go through persecution first, and God uses it to purify his church, to refine his church, to prepare his bride. But for those who are not followers of Jesus, who do not obey the gospel, there, according to the scripture, is an entirely different uh, end to the suffering. Now, we get this big word in 19, therefore, verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will and trust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Now, here's the one way to live because of what we learn about Christian suffering. So we've learned four lessons, clearly, but here's the one way, according to Peter, right here, that we're to live according to, the Christian su- su- uh, according to what we learn about Christian suffering, and it is this. And trust your soul to a faithful creator while doing good. And trust your soul to a faithful creator while doing good. So he acknowledges that God is the creator of the universe, and as such, he is sovereign, and he is faithful to his people. He will keep all of his promises. That is who he is. And so we trust and obey him by continuing to do good no matter the level of our Christian suffering. Like, no matter how hard it gets to push that rock up the hill, we keep pushing. We don't quit. We don't give up. Imagine Jesus, who we follow, when he was strapped to the pedestal outside the Antonia in Jerusalem to be whipped by two soldiers with a cat of nine t- tails. What if he just went, time out? I mean, I've suffered enough. That's, that's, not, that's not who we follow. He went through it, and then he marched to the cross, and then he hung on the cross, and then he died on the cross. He was persecuted ultimately, he had victory over death and all that, but he went through it, and he is 
our rabbi. He is the one that we follow. He's the one that said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. And in my opinion, we, the church of Jesus Christ, are in a moment in history where he is teaching us to entrust our souls to him, the faithful creator. And we continue to lean in, no matter what kind of Christian suffering comes. Now, how do do we do this? How do we lean in like that? How do we entrust our soul to a faithful creator while doing good? Most people want to uh, hide in the midst of persecution. What are we to do? Well, here's what we get from the whole of the context of Scripture. Number one, keep our eyes on Jesus and look beyond the present circumstances. Keep our eyes on Jesus and look beyond the present circumstances. So there is more to it than than what seems like uh, never-ending suffering or persecution. There are promises. There's an eternal plan. There's a a place in heaven prepared for you, according to the Scripture. There is no more weeping, no more tears, no more crying, no more pain. We keep our eyes on Jesus, and we keep an eternal perspective. We, we remember that there are bigger things beyond the present circumstances. Secondly, in the midst of Christian suffering or persecution, we exhibit radical obedience, radical obedience, Christ and his kingdom over everything, Christ and his kingdom over everything. We hear and obey. We deny ourselves and we follow him. This is how we entrust our soul to a faithful creator. We, while doing good, we hear and obey. And here's the third thing, mind over emotion. Mind over emotion. A lot of times people think following Christ is a feeling. There are feelings associated with it. Some, some are really great and some are really bad sometimes. But following Christ in the midst of Christian suffering, Christian persecution will mean that you have to uh, trump your own emotion with your mind. And that requires the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. About uh, a year ago, I started working out with a friend. I hadn't worked out like for real in a long, long time. And we started in July in his garage. It's hot. Right? It was just me and him. And I remember this one particular workout. I had all these push ups in it. And I couldn't, at that point, I, could, I couldn't do it. I just, my body just would not do it. And he kept telling me, it's mental, it's mental, it's mental. And I was like, you're mental. And if I could feel my arms, I would throat punch you right now. But I didn't because I couldn't move. <laughs> I was a sweaty mess, right? But as the years gone by, the thing that I've learned is that no matter how, how much stronger you get or how, how, how much in shape you get, the workout always gets harder. It never gets, you never like top the mountain. And I have learned one thing is that your body will tell you, I don't feel like doing this anymore, right in the middle of it. And your emotion will agree with your body. I'm done. This is stupid. Who does this? right? But your mind can trump all that. There's something inside of you that can overcome what you're feeling with with things that you know to be true because of your experience in the past. I've survived this feeling before. I didn't die. I threw up in a bush, but I didn't (laughs) die just once. And so... Your mind can trump. So when it comes to Christian suffering, what about those guys from Ethiopia on the beach, lined up, singing hymns before their their heads were decapitated. How does that happen? That's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and that is their mind trumping their emotion. They're believing the promises. What's Peter quoting here? Isaiah, Proverbs, Jesus himself, You got to know this stuff because when Christian suffering comes, you're going to be the man in the rock. Why do I have to push this? Why do I have to go through this? Why, 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 why? And you're going to remember, you're going to have to remember, rejoice and be glad. The spirit of the Lord is going to rest upon you. And if you die, you're going to a better place. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. See, this is Christian suffering. 
You remember the man in the rock? It's a lot like that. And the question becomes, are you leaning in or running away from? Because this is the test of faith. I'm glad that I have not faced an enormous amount of Christian suffering in my life. Yet the scripture tells me to be prepared, to not be surprised, and to rejoice and be glad when it happens. And I would call on you, the church of Jesus Christ, to lean into this letter today, to think through these things as followers of Jesus and ask yourself, the pandemic isn't even Christian persecution, but is it pushing you farther from God or drawing you closer to God, that kind of suffering? That will tell you how you will respond if you're insulted for your faith, if you are, are persecuted for your, 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 your allegiance to Christ. That's a little indicator. Let's, let's pray. Father, we bless your name. You're a good and holy God, righteous above all. We worship you. Lord, we know throughout history, all over the world, many Christians have faced persecution, some under the sound of my voice even now. Father, we pray for those that face persecution for your namesake daily. God, would you give them strength? Would you help them to rejoice and be glad? And Father, would you, for the church of Jesus Christ here in the West, for this church, Bay Area Church, God, would you prepare us? Thank you for this letter from Peter, inspired by your Holy Spirit, that prepares us. Lord, help us not to be surprised. Help us to rejoice and be glad, help us to see it as refining and help us to entrust our souls to you and continue to do good. We love you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for your spirit that indwells us. We pray it in Christ's name, amen.